Hey, this is Jeremy. Uh, Just wanted to hop on before the episode started with a few announcements. Uh, We really want to hear from you. And perhaps the best way to do that, we actually have a subreddit now. Uh, It's just r slash polyphonic press. And I'll leave a, a link to it in the show notes. But it's always been my dream to have a community where we can all get together and and talk about the albums that we we review and just music in general. So uh, if you want to join the community and start the community, really, because it's it's uh, quite small right now, uh, it's just r slash polyphonic press. And you can always help out the show in various ways. You can check out our Patreon and get these episodes the day before that they go live. And uh, leave a rating and a review on uh, Apple Music or Spotify or wherever you're listening. Those are great ways to get in touch with us as well. Uh, That's it. I just wanted to say that. And uh, now on to the episode. Thank you. The podcast where two music fans pick a classic album completely at random. Using the patented random album generator, they are given an album to review from a curated list of over 1,000 classic releases, spanning multiple genres. And now onto the show. Here are your hosts, Jeremy Boyd and John Van Dyke. Hey, hey, welcome to Polyphonic Press. I'm Jeremy Boyd. And I'm John Van Dyke. And uh, let's not waste any time. We've got the patented random album generator right in front of us here. Uh, So let's hit the button and see what album we're going to be listening to this week. And the album we're going to be listening to is Only Ones, The Only Ones. Okay. Okay. Um, No idea. No, Um, it's not really ringing a bell for me either. Only Ones. Okay. Pop rock group in the 70s. It's their self-titled album. Is it their debut album? It is their debut album. Okay. Uh, So this is what it says on allmusic.com. It says, The Only Ones were a band that became identified with the British punk scene largely because a leader, Peter Parrott, had a funny voice and could write a great straightforward rock and roll song at, uh, at a time when such virtues were possessed almost exclusively by the Faster and Louder Brigade. This helps explain why the only one self-titled debut is regarded as a classic of the first wave of UK punk, despite the presence of the mid-tempo jazz accent and breaking down. The 50s pop moves of the opening cut, The Whole of the Law, The Beast, which um, sounds like some sort of lethargic neo-boogie, and the graceful semi-acoustic semi-samba, No Peace for the Wicked, Of course, when the only ones felt like rocking out, they did it brilliantly, and along with the instant classic Another Girl, Another Planet, this album includes the sinister but rollicking City of Fun and the feedback-drenched crunch of the immoral story, which points uh, to another factor that made the only ones heroes in their day. Their eclecticism was rooted in a genuine talent for embracing different sounds rather than the inability to pick a style and master it. Parrot and his bandmates John Perry on guitar, Alan Mayer on bass, and Mike Kelly on drums sound like a tight and imaginative imaginative combo, even when they're surrounded by keyboard and horn overdubs, and Parrot's tales of one guy's search for love and coherence in a fractured world are intelligent, witty, and de- deeply cutting at all times. Uh, at all times. If the creative ambition of the only ones sometimes comes at the price of a tight stylistic focus that would make these songs uh, cohere better, every track is memorable in its own way, and these 10 songs always have heart, soul, and honesty to spare. And if that isn't always the benchmark of punk rock, it's at least in the neighborhood. All right. Well, it doesn't have to be punk to be good. No. Uh, um... Okay, so, yeah, so this album was released in April of 1978, and the genres are power pop, new wave, and punk rock, Um, and was released on Columbia Records and produced by The Only Ones and Robert Ash. Um, And there are 10 songs on the album, and it's split pretty evenly 
five and five. Uh, so what we'll do is if you're listening along with this, which we encourage you to do, uh, and I've linked the album in the show notes to both Apple Music and Spotify, so you can listen listen on your uh, preferred uh, medium. Um, and so what we do is we'll take the album at the halfway point or side one and side two, and we'll discuss halfway through. Uh, so if you're if you are listening along, we'll stop. Uh, the album starts with the song "The Whole of the Law," and side one stops with the the song called "The Beast." So we'll stop there and uh, we'll discuss halfway through. Okay. So uh, so yeah. So here we go. Here's the first song on the album called "The Whole of the Law." Here we go. All right. Okay, and ending side one with the beast. Um, yeah, this is really good. Yeah, this is pretty good. His voice gets some takes some getting used to at first. Yeah, I yeah, I definitely felt that the first song. I was like, oh, this is it, the first song was odd because it's it's a slower ballad sort of thing. Yeah, it's it's nothing like the rest of the album. It's it seems to be. Uh, or at least nothing like the second, like the first half of the album. Yeah, the first half. And um, and and when his voice came on on that, I was like, "Oh, okay, I don't know about this." <laughs> yeah, he's kind of like a cross between Mark Bolan and Lou Reed. Yeah, that's perfect. That's kind of perfect. Yeah, yeah. He's um, he's. I think his voice fits better with the other songs rather than the whole of the law. Um, but yeah, it does take some getting used to, but it wasn't that, that bad once I got, got into it. Um, I mean, this is, you know, British rock bands in the night, late 1970s. I mean, they all kind of sound like this, not all of them, but it's a very common style. Yeah. In this era, it's definitely got a sort of a punk attitude, but, but yeah, like they were saying the band, when you listen to what the band's doing, it's not really punk. It's very pop rock. It's very, it's almost like, uh, well, it reminds me of like what Blondie was doing, although they, they would sometimes be considered punk as well. Sometimes. Well, I, I, I think a good comparison would be like, not the vocals, but the music is, it reminds me of The Knack. Okay. Um, so yeah, The Knack or... Uh, like that that power the late 70s power pop new wave sort of stuff like cheap yeah. trick um yeah the even Nat. tom petty and the heartbreakers yeah or the, yeah um especially that guitar player he reminds me of mark campbell yeah in places the, yeah the that last uh the last song i was like oh this is some stuff that mike campbell would do yeah and really? so it's like oh okay all right this is cool yeah yeah i like that last song the beast is a really good song yeah um, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is, I, the, the review was right in that not all this, there isn't a whole lot of cohesiveness for the album. Uh, like all of the songs are pretty different stylistically in structure, tempo, um, chord structure. Like there's, I think they're sort of try on this album. There's maybe still trying to figure out who they are and sort of trying to find their sound. I think it was well I think they sort of found a sound it's just their sound is an is an eclectic sound um they've just got a lot of things and this is their first album and it's sort of a a mixed bag of what they had at that time so far so I think that's really all this is it's just a collection of their stuff that they were doing it's certainly not a um a concept album <laughs> no definitely not definitely not um, and it's, it's interesting. They were, um, the, the other heartbreakers, Johnny Thunders and the heartbreakers, uh, they, um, they were heavily influenced by that. Um, I was reading a bit about them and, uh, they, okay. So they, they were, had something to do with that band as Parrot and Kelly, uh, caught the eye of Johnny Thunders, founding member of the New York Dolls and the Heartbreakers, and worked as a sideman on Thunders' debut solo album. 
so alone, notably appearing together on the classic You Can't Put Your Arms Around a Memory. However, drug addiction, particularly heroin use, derailed their career, and Parrot had only sporadically been heard from since the band broke up in 1982. Yeah, they they only put out three albums. Yeah, that's sort Um, of a shame. It kind of reminds me of Big Star. I, yeah, I was, I was gonna say that too. A big star, big star doesn't really. They get a lot of credit in like music circles, but they don't get a lot of credit for really kicking off the the power pop, the power thing. pop, punk rock, whatever you want to call it. The, this this sort of alternative to, I guess, progressive rock that was pr- yeah. prominent in the seventies. Big at this time, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They. They were huge um, influences, and and I guess they're sort of these guys are, or at least the the singer was uh, was it Peter Parrot? Yeah, he was largely considered the British Johnny Thunders. Um, so uh, so yeah, so it's it's real interesting. I've never heard of these guys. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really interesting so far. Well, I might have heard of them in passing, but again, I never really, for some reason, it didn't click. But the name, the only ones, does sort of. There's something there that clicked in my past, but I knew I'd never heard anything of there. Just that I I knew there was a band called the Only Ones or something, and even then, that was a very vague bell. So yeah, I've yeah I've. I'm yeah, I I think I'm in the same vein as you as like I may have heard the name somewhere, but didn't know anything about them. Um basically, yeah. Yeah, it's one degree mo- removed from never hearing of them. But yeah, no, the the uh like I was saying, the the first song, it was a little tough to get through just because it was like and that's an odd choice to open the album with, I have to say. Uh Cause it really is. I mean, um, but then, but then when the second song came as another girl, another planet, I was like, Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I can get into this. I can get into this. Yeah. Um, and then by the time the beast, uh, had ended, I was like, yeah, this is, this is really good. This is really good stuff. Um, and yeah, it, his Volk, it's almost it like, it's almost like his vocals don't quite match the music. Like the, the, the music, like his vocal style, like the music should be like harder almost. Um, almost but, like, um, well, I thought, you know, production wise is almost like his voice didn't fit. Like they needed to do something else with his voice to make it fit the music a little bit better. I noticed that a little. Bit. Yeah. I felt, honestly, I felt his voice was a little thin and a little, like too much in the mid range. It could have used a little more, little more high end and maybe a little more bass, um, just to EQ a, a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, mixing is very hard, so I'm not going to complain too much. It's, it's no. fine. It sounds it, fine. It's, it's the That's way it nitpicking. is. It's, yeah. you know, going back and changing history is like whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess we'll uh, move on to the uh, second side of the album, and it starts off with the song uh, Creature of Doom. So here we go. Okay, and ending the album with The Immortal Story. Um... Yeah, I mean that was that last song was um, amazing. I mean that that instrumental part is just like wow, this is pretty cool. I mean, mm. uh, yeah, I yeah, I I'm really liking this. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, but yeah, I I kind of I'm I'm more and more getting into this period of uh, you know just like that power pop sort of thing. Um, I've always been a fan fan of the power pop of the Mm sixties, but, uh, yeah, the power pop of the seventies, absolutely. Um, and, and even into the eighties. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of a a punk adjacent new wave adjacent sort of genre. It's rock and roll. It's rock and roll. It's rock and roll. Yeah. There's all these, there's all these labels. It's, it's rock and roll. Yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, no, I was going to say something about his voice. I can't remember what I was going to say. Well, you, oh, yeah. After, after you mentioned about the, you pointed out as, uh, that it's, uh, um, like a combination between Lou Reed and, and Mark Bolin. It's like, Oh yeah, I hear that. I so hear that, especially with some of, some of his phrasing is very Lou Reed. And, uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very pleasantly surprised, uh, with this album. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, there's there, I don't think there's really a bad song on the album, I would maybe arrange the songs on the album a little bit differently. I wouldn't open with the whole of the law. I would put that a little further into the album just to get people sort of warmed up to his voice. That might be uh, um, like an opener for the second side or something like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I, I think so too. Um, but uh, you know, it is where it is and true. I'll take it as it is. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I don't really have any complaints. Um, no, not really. The, the playing on it is great. Uh, the guitar playing is really good. Yeah. The band Uh, is actually really tight. They really are for, for a debut album. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. Um, I like that they, like, I, I like that they added the, the overdubs of the horns and the keyboards. It's done very, very tastefully. It's not in your face. It's not like overproduced or anything like that. It's exactly, it's like I, I wanted them there and they're just there being, you know, just another, another little flavor as opposed to saturating it in, in overproduction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's there to support the song, not to say, hey, listen to this horn player, listen to what they can do. You know, it's, it's there just as to fill yeah. the sound out a little bit. Yeah. Not that I have anything wrong with like bands like uh, Chicago or uh, um, Blood, Sweat, and Tears because I, I actually really love horn horn section bands like that. Right, but sometimes it can get to the point where it's like, uh, does that really need to be there? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Sometimes, and 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 the seventies was bad for that. Actually, the sixties was bad for that too, where they there was this uh, need like if if something got a little bit too commercialized, it was. It uh, wound up being like this. They had to make a big production out of it, and it mm-hmm. was a little bit too much in yeah. a lot of cases. And the the 60s and 70s were actually really bad for that in, in a lot of places. And, and a lot of that stuff is now forgotten because, you know, stuff like the Beatles and everybody else that put out good stuff kind of rose to the top, even if they weren't at the top of the charts at the time. Yeah. Well, that's... the. So, <laughs> Not that's that's a whole other thing, but that's what a kind, whole other. That's just a tangent I went on. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can edit this out, but I have I have something to say about that. Is okay. People, especially uh, older people, um, they go on. They tend to go on rants about today's crap pop music. Yes, they're forgetting <laughs> all the crap pop music that was out and in the 60s 70s 80s and whenever they grew up because yes. it doesn't last it's forgotten yes. and the best of the best always stays relevant but there was a lot of shit in the 70s and the 60s yeah you just forget about it there was a lot of novelty stuff there was a lot of uh yeah just overproduced stuff uh, a lot of just like you know what what's a hit song, or let's take all the hit songs. Get get like a studio um, band, usually one with an orchestra or something like that, to redo them without vocals, um, and and just crank these things out like they're paper plates, and uh, you know sell them to. Uh, well, I'm not 100 sure where who they sold them to, but they were everywhere, and you see them in like you know budget baskets at value village and stuff like that yeah all the time yeah um, exactly and, and not not just re-recordings of songs but like even like just like you pull out a uh a, a, an album at one of those discount stores and it's like who is i don't have who is that 
never heard of them. Ne- I don't know these songs. It's like that's yeah. Stuff, well, there's you know. there's there's some of that too, but uh, um, I don't know. There was there was a lot of like instrumental music that that would like, and I'm not talking about like Booker T and the MGs. They did that too, but they did it really well. Um, and there were bands like that too that just that did stuff really well. Plus, they had their own stuff. Um, they were just, you know, a really good band. And when you got them to back somebody else who had a an act that was completely on fire. Um, um, but anyway, getting back to this album, and I guess that sort of brings us to the to the the question is, would you listen to this album again? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is a uh, quite good. In fact, I'm probably gonna put it in my power pop um, list from of stuff from like you know uh, bands like. Uh, uh, the Stranglers and who else? There's lots of other bands that that I like to put in that list and stuff like that. Thought were excellent. So yeah, yeah. No, me too. I I'll definitely listen to this album again. Um, don't uh, like other than that one song being maybe misplaced in the album. I wouldn't take it off the album. I would just place it differently. Put it somewhere else. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, no complaints. I I would absolutely listen to this again. It's yeah. It's yeah. It's pretty good. Um, So, yeah, so I guess we'll end the episode there. Uh, Thank you very much for listening if you made it this far. Uh, We want to hear from you whether you agree or disagree with the uh, review of of this album. Um, You can uh, do that uh, a couple ways. You can go to the contact page at our website, uh, polyphonicpress.com, polyphonicpress.com slash uh, contact and um, yeah you can leave a review a uh, rating and review wherever you're listening to this album on um, Apple Podcasts Spotify or wherever and um, and uh, if you feel inclined you can also uh, check out our Patreon page and uh, you can get these episodes the day before they go live uh, just uh, patreon.com slash polyphonic press and I think that just about does it uh, I'm Jeremy Boyd 